Hi everyone, welcome back to History of Graphic Narratives. In this lecture, I'm going to explore the idea of graphic narrative modes. These are the ways in which stories can be told in pictures. And it's a very unique kind of vocabulary. I am almost certain you've never heard it before. So be patient, it's complicated, but I think once you get the hang of it, you'll start to be able to compare and look at various kinds of picture stories and kind of make sense of what they're trying to say. So to begin with, there are four basic kinds of narrative modes. They are singular, group, series, and sequence. So a singular essentially is one picture telling a story. Okay, A group is bunch of pictures that don't really have any particular way you're supposed to read them. So each part of the group helps out in understanding the idea of the story. Then you have a series, which is regular pictures in a row or in a line that add up to your story. And lastly is the sequence. And the sequence is the most complicated one of all. It's actually just like a comic book, and you've seen these before. But if you start to really understand that a sequence has all the potential of all the other modes, then sequences are really quite complicated. So the different kinds of narrative images have these narrative modes, and the modes are really defined by characters and actions and events and scenes. And so those are the kind of things we're looking for when we try and understand the mode. What kinds of characters are there? Are characters repeated? Can you see the same character more than once? What kinds of actions are happening? Who is acting and who is not acting in the, in the story? How many events are there? Is it just one event or is it multiple events? And again, how many scenes are there? Is it just one backdrop or are there multiple backdrops? So these are the kinds of questions that we are looking for when we're trying to understand that. And we have to start to look for ways of interpreting or understanding uh, narrative pictures. Let's look at this very curious picture by a very famous artist, Sandro Botticelli. And here he is illustrating a story of Dante's Inferno. He did this in 1490. Now what's interesting about this picture, you can clearly spot these colored figures along the top edge and then moving down the far right edge. And it's the same set of figures. They are repeated once, twice, three times, four times, five times in this picture. And so each of the times they are represented is indicative of another moment in the unfolding story. All the other characters here are not repeated. These are all the poor souls uh, being tormented in hell. And here we have Dante and Virgil moving through this landscape. So each of the pairs of images that make up these two moving characters represents what we might call a visual nuclei. It represents a space that they inhabit that represents a unique moment in time. Okay, there's not five of each of these people making this trip. It's the same set of people moving through the space. And so we have to learn how to sort of compartmentalize different parts. There's this one part of this picture where nothing is moving. Souls in hell are eternally damned. And yet this movement of these living characters who are both colorful and dynamic is to set up the contrast between those people who are damned in hell and then their living presence moving through it. So to tell all these different versions of narrative, I'm going to take one story. In this case, we'll call it a fable. And that is a well-known story. Maybe if you're familiar with the comic strip, 
peanuts you've heard of the story when lucy holds the football and tricks charlie brown to try and kick it but always right before he is about to kick it she takes away the football and he falls on his back so this joke was repeated so many times always at the beginning of football season and as this story evolved the situation continually changed but always lucy gets the better of charlie brown she finds yet another way to trick him okay now so let's say this is our fable how many different ways can we tell this story well to begin with we can do it as a single picture this is the monoscenic narrative this is where you have one picture and one picture alone and so if i was going to try and tell the story in one picture i would just show this one here now people who were familiar with the story could see this and go oh yeah that's the scene when lucy is pulling the ball away and charlie brown and charlie brown is saying it she did it again so this isn't the first time this has happened so this one picture is made to stand in for the whole story okay now in a single image that's how they work you can't really tell the whole story in one picture but you can indicate the story in such a way that someone who already knows the story can get it and that's how they work monoscenic narratives always invite the reader to show their knowledge of the story by recognizing what's going on now monoscenic narratives are not always so obvious now if i chose this picture as my one picture to represent this moment here we are not at the climax of the drama when she's pulling it away but instead at the beginning where you can see this sl sly smile and this little sing-song voice of hers and the football sitting out there ready to be kicked all of that leads us to realize there is this moment this moment that's about to begin and that this is really something that really familiar with the story you will totally understand where this is coming from and that is actually a more fun kind of discovery that readers enjoy okay so monoscenic narratives always sort of invite the viewer to understand the story through this one picture and we can see that going way back in antiquity here on a vase a single picture of the battle during the trojan war and here we have achilles and he's bearing down and about to kill the amazon queen penthesilea and this is a very pivotal and dramatic moment which you see she's utterly vanquished his spear is about to pierce her neck her spear is ineffectually pushed out of the way she's bending down she's backwards she's in this weakened position and he's bearing down on her and their eyes meet now for someone who knows the story you will be deeply rewarded by this beautiful rendition of this pivotal moment because to know the story is to know that at this point achilles falls in love with penthesilea and yet he cannot stop himself from murdering her as he is in his battle fury and he is so in such deep remorse for his actions that he quits the war and the entire greek army is standing there uh, ineffectually unable to continue its war on troy because their hero has quit the battle and so it's a powerful pivotal moment that's beautifully realized that love that achilles feels is somehow expressed in the way that her spear sort of crosses his heart as if he is sort of symbolically wounded by this love he feels a very interesting way in which comics use the monoscenic narrative is often they'll have a large picture that pieced together panels and this we can see is actually a modern comic version of the trojan war by eric shanar a thousand ships in the scene we have helen of troy pleading to the king of troy to let her in the city and by his side are his sons 
And in this wonderful, pivotal moment in the story, just like our vase, we see the battle lines drawn. We see the ways in which political allegiances have been formed and the struggle that the Trojans feel for allowing this woman into their city. And they know that this is a very dangerous situation that they are going into. Furthermore, we can see this technique in many different countries. And this is what makes studying modes of narrative so valuable, is that it allows us to compare narrative strategies in different countries. Here is a monoscenic narrative from a chapter in the Tale of Genji from the 11th century Japan. And in this scene, we see the queen being attended to by her court ladies. And all around, it's the break of spring, and they're taking down the winter clothes, and they're preparing for spring. And so there's a kind of happiness in the court as they prepare for the early spring festivals. Unfortunately, in all this excitement, someone has left the door ajar. You can sort of see it there, right center of the picture in the upper portion. That door screen is slid open, and a man we don't see is walking on the outside of the ladies' chamber, and he looks in, and he sees this woman. If you follow the top line of that hanging toward her, you see that she's reading a book. This is to sort of draw our attention to her. And we see she becomes the object of this man's desire. And he plots to get her, and he impregnates her, and she is so mortified she will eventually commit suicide. So all of this happens in this innocent moment, in this quiet and beautiful moment of early spring as suddenly portents of disaster and tragedy are, are being sown. So it's a wonderfully poignant a picture that really capitalizes on the monoscenic narrative. Another kind of way in which you can tell a story in a single picture is the synoptic narrative. In this case, you're actually going to have repeated characters. So you're not just showing one moment, you are showing a couple of moments or three or four moments in a single landscape. And you're not trying to tell a very long or complicated story. You're basically just trying to get uh, the idea of it. So here I've taken the story of Charlie Brown and Lucy and the football, and I've created a kind of landscape where it's all happening at the same time. Even though we see multiple representations of Charlie Brown Lucy, since we know the story, we can parse out that it starts in the lower left, moves to the upper right, then goes across to the upper left, and then comes down to the bottom. And so a lot of times in these synoptic narratives, which means sort of a single picture story, they're talking about an event that may not follow in a linear pattern like this. Let me give you an example here of an actual painting. This painting here, called The Tribute Money by Masaccio in the mid-15th century, uh, we see this story of Christ who has been asked by the tax collector to pay his tax. And he directs St. Peter to go to the water and get the money from a fish's mouth. And so we see Christ in the center, ordering Peter to go. And so it starts in the picture where our eye is led right to Christ. The tax collector has his back to us. So that's one thing that catches our eye, but immediately his gesture leads us to Christ and then over to St. Peter, who's pointing to the water. He goes to the water. So our second moment, our visual nuclei is this area over to the left. And then the final moment on the right, framed by the building, we see St. Peter again with the money in his hand paying the tax collector. So these three separate moments are sort of encapsulated in this single landscape. You can also see this in contemporary art. This is a very famous painting by Charlotte Solomon, Life or Theater, where she is representing uh, the suicide of her mother that she never knew. This all was told to her much later. 
when she was an older woman um, and not as a young child. Her mother is in bed. A nurse who is attending her leaves. We see the nurse three times moving upward to the door and the mother gets out of bed, walks to the window and jumps out. And we can see her foot leaving the windowsill from below. And so in a single space, we have these multiple characters creating this kind of shifting, dreamlike recreation of this tragic moment. Now let me talk to you about another kind of mode narratives, and those are group. And there are two kinds of group, panoramic narratives and simultaneous narrative. Let's start with panoramic narratives. In a panoramic narrative, you have no repetition of characters. All of the events are sort of more or less happening at the same time. So imagine a football game with all of the Peanuts characters. And we can see them each in turn with their own football, each taking a turn, kicking, catching, running, doing various football game-like activities. And of course, at the end, we see Charlie Brown who fails at his football activity. So we're comparing now all these different moments and Charlie Brown is clearly the outlier. It allows us to kind of look into a very complicated scene and build a sense of drama of this big football game is happening and all these characters are involved. This was a very common strategy when describing important epic battles. And so you would see all these soldiers across the battlefield. And there may be a few key battles, uh, but this is something that goes way back in ancient art, one of these battle scenes where pairs of characters are facing off and doing battle with each other. And there is no sense of time progressing across this large relief statue or painting, but there is a sense of uh, drama and action in each of the areas of conflict. Another way in which we can see this kind of group narratives is in this what's called a miscellany. This is a, the cover of an illustrated uh, police journal called Police News. And all of the pictures on here are essentially different stories that are all happening about the same time in the news. And so it's not, even though it looks sort of like a comic, none of the panels are actually sequential, meaning this or serial, this leads to that. There's the pair of images in the center. We see the, the healthy woman and the murdered woman side by side, just before and an after. And that really constitutes kind of a single image, before and after. Every other scene here is its, its own story. So there's a composite action happening, giving you a sense of all of the sort of excitement surrounding the events of the police in London. Another kind of way in which this is used in more contemporary comics, we can see this in the panoramic narrative, okay? This is where you have a series of panels which are sort of looking around the scene. So these three panels say, it's a lovely summer's day, the flowers are blooming, it's clear skies, the birds are flying, and all the people are gathered together, both happy and crying. So with those three panels, we can deduce that this is what you call a wedding scene, perhaps, the way people are anticipating a happy union. The panoramic narrative is sometimes referred to in this modern context as aspect to aspect. Simultaneous narratives are some of the oldest narrative types and are some of the more difficult ones to read. And I'll finish with this. They are old in the sense that they are pre-literature. So if there is a culture or people who don't have a system of writing, their stories kind of overlap each other. They don't represent one story, but stories sort of interlocking. And that interlocking parts of the stories helps people remember them. So you know that in this story, 
this story crosses the path of that story and that meeting of those two stories helps you remember the relationship between the stories and the individual events of one to the other. They sort of reinforce one another. So a simultaneous narrative is multiple characters, actions, events, all overlapping each other. We can see that in this very abstract painting by Michael Jagamara Nelson, Five Dreamings. This is literally five different paths of the ancestors overlapping. Each of the narrative paths, we see uh, different mythic locations where the ancestors stopped and rested and changed the landscape. And so there is a connection between the ancient ancestors of the Aborigines of Australia and the way in which they retell these stories in actions. We can also see this in Native American Indians, the retreat up the hill battle, uh, writing in stone. This is uh, a battle that shows many, many different events happening all at the same time. It sort of records the deaths of powerful and important people, and it also re records the number of teepees burned and horses captured. Another very interesting use of the simultaneous narrative creates uh, an ambiguity in the reader. And some artists use this to uh, underscore our own visual exploration of the picture. This is a really interesting book by Tom Filaments called The Humament. He has taken a book called The Human Document, and he has gone through and painted out portions of the book, revealing certain words and then linking those certain words together in this sort of meandering way. And in this case here, he is sort of invoking the idea of Shakespeare's Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. To be Hamlet from a different book. And so he's, he's actually evokes the idea of Hamlet and he invokes the idea of this way in which these two voices, these two different paths, these actually three different paths sort of overlap each other as separate voices happening on the single page. A lot of artists use the simultaneous narrative to create a kind of landscape uh, where there's this kind of humor. This is Grant Snyder's really funny story coaster where he talks about the various elements of a story as if it were a roller coaster. And he's kind of creates elements of the story. So there's no really one clear path how you're supposed to read this. You essentially follow the path of the roller coaster. But there are a lot of places like the deep backstory or the extraneous scenery or the unresolved subplot, all of these different areas that end up giving you a much richer and varied idea of this total idea of the story. So landscape is still a really important idea in reading graphic narratives. And often that openness that landscape provides gives people more opportunities to introduce subplots and complementary ideas that a very linear structure won't allow. Perhaps the master of the complex narrative is Chris Ware, who creates many of these incredibly dense narrative pictures that there is no one way to read. You sort of start in one area and you kind of meander along and your eye goes down and over until you somehow make your way to the bottom. And this meandering way you read this comic allows you to experience it differently. There is no correct or wrong way to read this. There are multiple paths through this picture. And as you're looking at it, you start to notice some really curious coincidences like the Empire State Building on the left, and then this pencil stub on the right, and the way the two of those sort of stand in contrast to each other, the way this portrait of this person that we're reading about is sort of fixed in the center. There's a sort of a visual way it all makes sense, even though it's so rich and full and dense of narrative detail.
Okay, so this is our first lecture on graphic narrative modes. I've covered the two basic kinds, which are the single and the group. And there'll be two more lectures where we'll delve into the series and, and finally the sequence.